After the last video's success, that being the Devil Deal vs. Angel Deal debate, I wanted to take a stab at a larger, more controversial aspect of Repentance, and probably its biggest addition, the alternative floors. These alt floors are a set of four newish chapters added into the game as a way to bridge access to the new Mother Boss, as well as adding some extra padding to the game to make it feel a bit less repetitive. Think of them as a sort of in-between chapter you can access at the end of most normal floors in the game. Within these four chapters, there are seven variations of floors to explore. These floors changed the way Isaac is played immensely, and I could not be happier at that prospect. While we did get the Blue Womb and the Void floor in the previous DLC, they weren't game-changing additions. Blue Womb is hardly a floor, more of like a glorified boss fight, and Void is only accessible through Blue Womb or through a percentage chance spawn after each major boss. And because the Void floor came at the end of the game, there was not much throughout your normal run that it could change, just kind of a tiny bonus if your run was straight heat. But these alt floors are different. One thing I think a lot of people thought was missing from Afterbirth or Afterbirth Plus even, was the inclusion of a new path, or a set of floors that influences the run directly. But we got our wish, when it was announced that the fan-favorite Rebirth mod Anti-Birth would be getting a direct port into Isaac. Now there was a lot to be excited about within that statement, but the biggest thing for me personally wasn't the new characters, items, or bosses, it was the new floors. Floors you could choose to go to in place of the main path for extra bonuses and a challenge if you're feeling up for it. Something that actually directly impacted your run and could be used to boost your power. The first thing I'm going to cover are the floor's share mechanics, such as the item room mechanic. And after that, we'll take a look at each of the seven individually and assess their design, and answer that burning question that's divided this community since release. Do the alt floors fit in Isaac? As a side note, I'll be saving the bosses for a different video because this one's going to be long enough. I'll be going into room design, and enemy design, as well as the extra bonuses you can find while entering these floors. And then, I'll be comparing it to the way Rebirth has functioned since 2014, and if it truly feels like Isaac. And before we do that, I want to remind you all that I can't do these videos without your guys' support, so if you like what I do here, consider subscribing. It may seem arbitrary to you, but to me, it means a lot. Another great way to support me and this channel is to come follow my Twitch. If everyone who watched this video came to one stream, I would hit Twitch Partner in no time, which is my 2021 goal. Anyways, how do you even access these floors? Well. After you finish any floor up to and including Depths 1, a secondary door will spawn off of your boss room, which either leads to the Downpour of the Dross, the Mines of the Ash Pit, or the Mausoleum or Gahana. If you're going for Mother, after you fight the Mom Boss in the Mausoleum, you also get the option to go to the Corpse Floor if you break open the Flesh Door with your completed knife pieces. Starting off, both Basement 1 and Basement 2's doors will bring you down to the Downpour 1 and Downpour 2 respectively. I should also mention that once you enter these alt floors, you cannot leave them until you've reached the end of that chapter. Meaning, you can't go back to your main path until you've beaten Downpour 2, Mines 2, or Johanna 2. And these will always put you on the second floor of the next chapter. For example, if you go back to the main path on Downpour 2, we put on the floor Caves 2, Mines 2 brings you to Depths 2, and Mausoleum 2 brings you to Womb 2. Got it? Uh, hopefully. Before we examine Chapter 1.5 directly, let's first examine the benefits of these floors in a more general sense, before we go into the design of everything individually. For starters, the big pole of these alt floors is the double item rooms. Well, sorta. Okay, yes, there are two items in each room, but one of the items is always a curse with a blind effect on it. So it's more like one and a half item rooms, but it's still better than the normal floor, right? I wanted to take a minute and look at the mechanics of these item rooms. So for those of you who didn't play Anti-Birth, which is the original version of Repentance, the item rooms on these alt floors were truly double, with both items being visible. Am I really going to nitpick this tiny, tiny change? Yes, I am. I'm not saying having the choice between a visible item and a random item isn't a fitting reward, but I think the old way fits better. But not for every single floor. When we delve deeper into these floors' difficulties, you're going to see just how, well, difficult they can be. Specifically, the secondary variations, Dross, Ash Pit, and Johanna. These secondary alt floors are unlocked after you've beaten one of every boss at least once on its counterpart. For example, beating one of every boss in the downpour unlocks the Dross. Think of it as the seller of the first chapter. While both downpour and Dross are very similar, the difficulty spike from Mines to Ash Pit, and especially Mausoleum to Gahana, is very striking. They feel like completely different chapters. I think a more fitting reward the game could give you for making you play these secondary variations would be having the double item rooms both be visible items. Now, I have no issue with how the game plays out now, but a very frustrating thing to me is that I'm going to fight Mother, and I end up on the Gahana or even the Ash Pit. It's just a quick thought to make finding these secondary variations a bit less daunting. 
Maybe if making both items visible seems a bit too overpowered, you can instead have a higher chance to find a better quality item in these rooms. Just some thoughts, but if it stays the same, I'm just as happy. Anyways, let's hop on down to the downpour and see what's waiting for us. The downpour costs one key to enter after either basement 1 or 2's boss fight. For starters, when you first enter this floor, you find some of the coolest looking aesthetics in Isaac ever. If there is one single thing I'll gush over on every single alt floor, it's how amazing they look. Look at the colors, the lightning, the lighting itself. Even the water makes Bethesda jealous, it's insane. When the music kicks in, you feel like you find yourself in actual sewers full of bloated, slow moving, and lazy creatures that are more or less mindless. Just doing things for the sake of, well, doing things. You feel fear for the enemies. Not because you know they want to hurt you, but because they don't know what they want either. And the beautiful aesthetics don't stop there. The shops look incredible, the boss trap rooms as well. Every single room on this floor seamlessly fits the mood perfectly. And again, it doesn't stop there. Let's take a look at the enemies. Now, keep in mind, I've played over 600 hours of Repentance alone, whether it be in co-op, a streak, or gunning for Dead God, so I may have more practice than the average player. But you gotta believe me when I tell you this. If you find most of these floors too hard, you are just underpracticed. I'll be ranking the enemy design under classic tier list ranking, with S being the highest, followed by A, B, C, D, and F. And as a whole, the downpour has an S tier design. Most of your normal enemies can be found here, with slight variations, such as Gapers, Headless Gapers, and Claudies, all of which function more or less the same. I'll be more focusing on the new enemies, such as... Bubbles, a fatty type who when killed, rains a tower of tears down in a small radius from his last position. A tier, unique idea, fits the aesthetic, leads for some very unique and dynamic encounters when paired with other enemies, such as... Wraith, a shadowy gaper who can only be seen in the reflection of the water. S++++, is not like the coolest gimmick ever, it's like a fucking vampire, god damn that is so fucking cool. And it makes for quite the challenge and paired with Willows. A tier, only because they aren't called fireflies. Seriously, you guys really missed that one? Anyways, these little guys circle around you and occasionally fire tears. It's like a reverse distant admiration. They can really do a number on you and found among some Deep Gapers, which are enemies that appear after everything in the room has been beaten. B tier, while it's nice to have a little extra oomph to make a room seem a little more insurmountable, but with the randomness of their spawns, it can lead to some tight and almost unfair situations. But with how weak they are, they aren't hard to defend against. At least not as bad as... Blurbs, which are like gapers, but upon getting close enough or taking enough damage, they shoot a tight, compact, monstrous lung type attack at you. A tier. Easy enough to dodge, but that shot can come at crazy angles sometimes. Almost takes you off guard. It's even scarier to find them with... Level 2 Willows. Again, calling them fireflies gives them an extra rating boost. But I'll have to say B tier here. They aren't super common, and they kind of act like orbitals for enemies, which can be pretty annoying, but they aren't that bad. But the more annoying enemies are the... Small Leeches. B tier. These guys are easy kills, but just fast enough and just hard enough to see that they can just sneak up on you. Kinda similar is the... Strider, which is pretty much just a water spider. A tier. It's like a regular spider, but with 360 degree movement and longer dashes. It can really help rooms feel a bit more challenging, kind of like the subhorfs, which are stationary heads that only shoot when they move, whether it be by you or shooting them, or even an enemy pushing them. A tier, they make for some pretty fun rooms and good challenges. They really shine when they're paired with the Pulti, a rock flinging ghost. S tier, not only are they adorable, but they're also hella fun to dodge around. I love how they use them to open up paths and rooms, super genius. Can almost do the same for the Fissure. A little skull that hops out of pits and jumps around the room whatever direction that they're flung. They have good telegraphs, unique room design, and overall, are a great part of any room. Just like the Prey. Essentially a leech mulligan. I'll give it an A. You can't go wrong with a good old classic design, but it's nothing groundbreaking. Same goes for the Mulligool. Same deal as the Prey, but for Willows. Same deal, same rating. Good name. A tier. You can also say the same for... Bloaty, which is almost the same as the conjoined fatty, but they're blind, so should they creep out in random directions, along with a few tiers. I'm gonna have to say C tier, because random shots lead to some really, really dumb situations and impossible dodging. Oh man, okay, that was a lot of enemies to cover, but we did it. Overall, the downpour has an S tier aesthetic, music, enemy design, and is pretty on par with difficulty for where it is in the game. 
one thing I really fast wanted to say before we get too far in, and people get more and more mad at me for actually enjoying the alt floors and new enemies, is that they have every right to be among the harder floors in the game. A very common criticism I see is that for where they are in the game, chapter 1.5 to 3.5, is that they don't scale well with difficulty, and that you're not strong enough by this point in the game for the alt floors, and that is incredibly wrong. The people that I've seen say that are the same ones who only played Repentance off of a 1 million percent save file from Afterbirth Plus. If that's how you were introduced to Repentance, then, well, there's your issue. This update came with quite a lot of changes. Ones that you wouldn't really notice until you start over from scratch and are introduced to them gradually, and get used to the new buffs, nerfs, floors, bullet speeds, deals, etc. In the grand context of Isaac, the alt floors are some of the last floors you unlock on a file aside from Ascension. They're unlocked after you beat Hush three times. So unless you're playing the 30 character run, you'll be doing one run to Mom, 10 runs to Mom's Heart, and three more runs for Hush. Assuming you win all of these, that's 14 runs of re-unlocking and being reintroduced to the changes. And you gotta play, let's say, best case scenario, three runs through every alt floor to unlock the secondary variations. And by that point, you should be readjusted to the new difficulty. These floors are quite literally the last floors you unlock in the game aside from Ascension. They are supposed to be gauntlets of skill more than anything. And for new players, it'll take way more than 14 runs to see any semblance of the alt paths. Anyways, back to the video once again. Moving on to Dross, we have a similar situation to Downpour. Cool enemy designs, cool aesthetic, and more stellar banger music tracks. Let's take a look and examine the different enemies you can find down here. Drip, a little ball that just kind of rolls around. Think of it as this floor's dip. It's a B tier, a classic, but once again, again, nothing super groundbreaking. Big Corn, basically a dip, but shoots upon death. A tier, fantastic name. Splurt, he's like a mini dingle, dashes twice at you and drops two drips upon death. He can easily catch you off guard, but it's a cool design and a nice little challenge. B tier, again, it's nothing new. Cloggy, this guy will mess you up if you don't know what you're doing. He looks super intimidating, but just watch his patterns and you'll learn pretty quickly. He shoots in this rotating circular pattern that inverses every other shot, and you can usually quite literally just walk straight through. It's a nice, fresh change in bullet pattern choice to add some more life to the game. Definite A tier for me. Flytrap. It's like a husk that can only spawn attack flies that orbit him. He also occasionally throws them out into a larger orbit. Personally, I think he has a bit too much HP for this floor in the game, but he's never too much of an issue. I'll say B tier. Fartigan. A mulligan that'll cough up gas clouds and then throw an explosive shot on death. If that explosion shot hits a gas- dude, I can't even- this is so hard to say back to back, oh my god. If that explosion shot hits a gas cloud, it'll explode the gas cloud. This enemy is fine, but if you find him in a cramped room, you could be taking some pretty unavoidable damage. Overall, tough, but you know what? He's a fun little puzzle. A tier. Poot Mine. Pretty much a fartigan, but it's stationary. It's alright, but it doesn't add too much. B tier. It's got a pretty funny name as well. Dump. Slowly slides towards you, and after enough damage, it'll launch its head off its body, and it'll roll around the room while the body still stays there and expels some tears. Really cool design, but it can trap you a bit too easily if you're not careful. I like him though, A tier. Okay, so overall, I'm gonna give Dross an A tier. I like the aesthetic, but not as much as the downpour. Enemies are cool, but again, they're nothing too special. As a whole, I'll give this chapter an A, because there is one thing I haven't mentioned yet. But first, we need to talk about parallel universes, aka the Mirror World. This Mirror World can only be accessed on Downpour or Dross 2, and it is entered by touching that little white fire you find on those floors and becoming the Lost, then flying through the Mirror Door in one of the rooms. In this place you'll get your first knife piece, and have the opportunity to recomplete every room backwards for more drops, more tinted rocks, etc. And, if you're good enough, fight the boss for an extra item. This bonus alone makes the floor even more valuable, because it makes it possible to gain two boss items instead of one, being the only floor in the game aside from the void floor that allows that. I just love how unique that bonus is, and I wish more floors had things like that. So, Chapter 1.5 gets an S tier from your boy. Next up, Mines and Ash Pit. This is that first pairing where the disconnect starts to form for me. Mines, I absolutely love. Ash Pit? Not so much. Let's first look at Mines, since you do see it first on a new file. 
Out of all the new floors, Mines and Downpour have my favorite music. Mines also has another really cool aesthetic and great visual effects. And also, this is where we start to see some more trap rooms, which I think our Repentance does so much better than Afterbirth or Plus ever did. Let's talk about trap rooms in this update. They're insane, like not even just cool. They did things that base Afterbirth never even tried to do, which was seamlessly combine enemy attacks with buttons, spikes, and other unique mechanics. This becomes extremely apparent in the mausoleum and the corpse, but more on that later. The introduction of instant death buttons is a great inclusion for the mines floor, as once again, it thematically fits and makes these rooms more dynamic. The overall room design is chock full of mazes of rocks and pits that add to the overall feel of these floors. The cramped nature feels like you're actually walking through, well, an abandoned mine. The clustered and almost randomly placed rocks feel like the place really hasn't been tread upon for a long, long time. It's such a really cool feel. To elaborate further, general feeling that these floors portray is also complemented very nicely by the enemy design. These floors are meant to be you exploring new domains in Isaac. It's the newest fully fledged path we've had in quite a while. It is an unknown place filled with things that have been there for quite a while that you're just stepping into for the very first time. Nearly every enemy in this path is able to move more freely than you, which is where a lot of this floor's challenge comes from. Like all the flying enemies that can avoid the many rocks that populate the floor, or these rock charging things that are able to break way for themselves. It really adds to the feeling that you're not really supposed to be here. A good comparison here is the game Hades. It's you trying to escape from some place you're supposed to be trapped in, and having to adjust to the rooms that favor the enemies. And while we're on the topic of enemy design, let's take a look at all these suckers individually. First off, we have the Rock Spider, who is pretty much just a spider with armor. They can catch on fire if they touch anything hot, like a fire, which will allow their rock shell to do even more damage after they're dead. I'll give them a B tier, because while it does fit thematically, it doesn't really add anything super groundbreaking. Next up is the Coal Spider, who is just a flaming rock spider. It's the same deal, B tier. Tinted Rock Spiders. These are spiders that pop out of rocks and on death drop soul hearts. A tier. As annoying as these guys can be, it's a really cool design quirk. Fly Bomb. A really quick fly that darts around the room towards Isaac and turns into a mini bomb when they're killed. These guys are B tier to me. The same kind of deal as the rock spiders, but the bomb aspect is pretty cool. Danny. Danny's like the blurbs of the downpour, but instead of shooting out tears, it's rocks. Some of them could actually also be rock spiders. I'm not a huge fan of enemies that can spawn other enemies, I've got that after with plus void portal PTSD still, but again, these guys are probably a low A tier. They look really cool and definitely help you feel claustrophobic on these floors. Coal Boy. The same thing as Danny's, but they instead shoot out hot rocks, so again, A tier. Blaster. These are the dudes that shoot out the bomb flies. These guys are S tier for me. They're almost like little mini bosses, they have a ton of health, which may seem daunting at first, but the game makes you fight them differently. You're not meant to shoot them to kill them, but to knock the bomb flies back into them, which is a 1 to 2 shot to kill. Cool, cool, cool design. We need more of this in Isaac. Definite S tier for me. Bouncer. Bouncers are sort of like mulligans, but if you don't kill them fast enough, their head puffs up and they chase you down. Depending on how late you kill them, they could cover the entire room with a ton of tears. While yeah, they're a bit obnoxious, they aren't that hard to kill, it to some really cool room dynamics. Definite B tier. Quakey. These guys are the fatties of this chapter. They'll walk slowly towards you, but will occasionally stomp on the ground, firing eight tears out and causing rocks to rain down around them. I've seen a lot of hate for these guys, but I seriously don't get it. I've literally never been hit by the falling rocks. They have very clear telegraph shadows on the ground. I love the design and the attacks. Definite A tier. Gyro. You know that wheel power up from Kirby? Like, the most fun power in the game? Yeah, it's trying to kill you now, and it does it looking sick as fuck. S tier. Grilled Gyro. Hell yeah, dude. Straight S tier. Even better than the last guy. Just hell yeah, man. Fireworm. Besides being my high school nickname, these guys are insanely easy to kill. Honestly, they're a little too easy to kill. I kinda wish they had more HP. I never really get to see them attack. B tier. Hardy. These are like those mini dingles from before, except they're rocks, and a whole lot more deadly. When it hits the wall, it fires off some rock projectiles, and the more hits it does to itself, the more rocks that come off, and the less HP it has. S tier. That is a sick as hell enemy design. Faceless. It's a pretty standard Isaac enemy. Nothing really special going on here. As average as it gets. B tier. Mole. It's kind of like a tube worm, but when it pops up, it fires three shots at you. You can also kind of track its movement for the rocks on the ground. Again, pretty standard B tier. 
soy creep. Like a wall spider, but with soy milk. It can add some pretty cool temporary barriers to rooms. I love the design implication. A tier. Dragonflies. Okay, these guys are pretty cool, right? But I have one major, major complaint. I love how I telegraph their attacks with the eyes. That's clever, and based off their eyes, you can see where the death fire is going to spread when they die. My complaint is this. Why the fuck does the fire travel over rocks and past pits? That literally makes, like, zero sense to me. I hope that gets fixed, but until then, C tier. Hard hosts. Hard hosts are like hosts, but instead of firing tears at you, they create rock fissures. These fissures can be used to break open rocks, doors, and chests, and there's some pretty clever designs used with this mechanic in mind. The enemies themselves are B tier, not the most unique, but their application is A. Pawn slash Brainless Knight. Ever wonder what it's like to be Preets? Take a look at the Brainless Knights and the Pawns. They're like your standard knight enemies, but they function like massive infamy, needing to kill the brain to kill the knight. Pretty cool design and application. A tier. And that is literally every new enemy found on the mines floor. Overall, I'd give it an A tier. Some of the designs on these floors and how the enemies interact with the environment feel so smooth and natural. It makes you feel super smart when you flawlessly play a room out. Very, very enjoyable. You can't really say the same for the Ash Pit. There's a reason this floor is nicknamed the Ash Pit. Now, I know before that I said claustrophobia in the mines was a good thing. But that was because it was perpetuated by the rocks and obstacles, not just the enemies. Your goal in the mines was to play around with those enemies, to have them break rocks for you, or line up against the rocks to dodge. The floor was confined and tight, but the enemies helped interact with that to make it more manageable, as well as there always being a safe path out of danger for you. Now the Ash Pit seems to double down on that claustrophobia in not the best way, or just throws that whole design idea out the window entirely. Here, either the rooms are extremely empty and devoid of anything interesting, or they are the most cluttered and frustrating rooms yet. I don't like calling things in games lazy, because no matter what you add, it took time and effort to code that in. But some of the rooms on this floor, for lack of a better word, just kind of feel lazy. I mean, even the enemies don't feel inspired by anything. I guess that's where the main issue really is. There isn't really an aesthetic this floor is going for. When you hear the word ash pit, you think of fire, clouded vision, smoke, and ash. The only thing you find on this floor is smoke. I mean, over half the rooms have no more than like four enemies in them. The floor is practically one flat color, and the smoke effect doesn't even really provide any kind of visual depth. Hell, the most enemies I found in the room was a 2x2, two two, and it was only 8. Now before we go more in depth on the enemy designs, let's gather my thoughts. The stage's theme is uninspired. The floor is pretty much just one solid texture with nothing going on. There's no connecting theme, no cool mechanics, and the enemies thematically fit more in the depths of Necropolis than the Ash Pit. The designs are hardly anything new. And the introduction of dust knocks this floor down a whole nother tier. Let's dive into the enemy design. Aside from the boys added in the mines, we also have... Boneflies. Flies that upon death split into three bone shots. We've seen enemies like this before, and there's nothing really new going on here at all. B tier. Big Bony. A fatty that shoots out a rubber cement bone you can break just by shooting. It's just a fatty with a tier. While the bone can add for some extra dynamic stuff for rooms, it's really nothing new at all. B tier. Pasty. It's a mini Skolex. There is zero way to tell if the room you just walked into has these in there. And while personally, it's never gotten me hit, I believe every enemy should be telegraphed to at least some degree. C tier. Flesh Maiden. A floating, badass-looking Isaac who swoops towards you. Great visuals, cool attack pattern, fresh, A tier. Dusty Death's Head. Invincible heads that move through rooms and only dies when the room is cleared. These would be fine if they weren't so obnoxiously close to each other. They aren't even used for any unique rooms, just button puzzles you can one cycle anyways. C tier. Underutilized and super annoying. Red Skull. A Death's Head that when close to you, spits out a ring of fire. It feels like an artificial way to expand a Death's Head's hitbox. This guy can make for some tense situations. B tier. <sighs> Dust. My least favorite enemy in the game, and let me explain why. So, these guys have no indication they're in a room, and they slowly move towards you. The closer they are, the faster they are. So let's say you're dodging an enemy's attack, and you dodge into a corner. Because you're both moving at each other, and they're invisible, you have no way to react. There needs to be some kind of telegraph that this enemy is present in the room, like how all the other ghost enemies have. Let's give me half a second to see where they all are before they disappear. Oh, and did I also mention they can literally combat log? They teleport away after you hit them and go somewhere random in the room. I hate it. F tier for fucking what? 
Clickety clack. They're just bony globins. The only big difference is you can't kill them until you've knocked down every other clickety clack in the room. Again, nothing special. B tier. Bomb gagger. Also my high school nickname, well, minus the bomb. These guys are rare as hell, but also sick as hell. They spawn gigabombs and run away. Cool design, cool visuals, A tier. Necro. The name proves my point that literally all of these enemies are better off being on Necropolis. And this guy also sucks. He spawns bones randomly around the room and flings them at you. It's pretty much an enemy who telefrags you, not cool. His bones can literally spawn like anywhere. If you shrink that radius down you have a fun little challenge, but as it is, D tier. Princess Carrion. It's a mini version of Carrion Queen, but they move diagonally. It's a nice change of pace from the regular leech pattern, and it actually almost fits the theme, despite Carrion Queen not even spawning on these floors. B tier. Loose Knight. A knight with a brain that'll fall out after being hit. An extra twist on the normal Mask of Infamy enemies. It's alright, B tier. And that is every new Ashbit enemy found in the game. And overall, they're just not starting to feel like reskins of other previous enemies you encounter, or are just super basic. I'll give enemy design a B for this floor, and overall aesthetic a D. As we go into the last half of these floor ratings, I need to mention one other thing. Like I said in the intro, one of the main points of the alt pass is to acquire the knife pieces so you can go fight the new mother boss. Knife Piece 1 is found on Downpour 2 in the Mirror World, and Knife Piece 2 is found on Mines 2 in the Mother's Shadow section. This Mother's Shadow section is an intense chasing sequence where an invincible boss chases after you, and you have to escape. It's a really cool sequence in the game, but after your third or fourth time doing it, it definitely gets a bit tedious. I've seen a lot of complaints on how annoying it is to go to Mother just for fun, but you gotta grab Knife Piece 1 on literally floor 3, so I'll give my take on it. While yes, I really truly do enjoy the alt path, the way to get to Mother is annoying. Whether you're going for unlocks or just for fun, going to Mother is abysmal. With every other branching path in the game, you get multiple choices. You get to choose your end goal path on floor 6 to picking up either the negative or the polaroid, and or going to beast. And you get one last chance to go back on that choice along floor 8, with the extra path the hush also appearing. And you're always able to change paths with the use of a sacrifice room. Mother is different. If you want to go to Mother, you have to make that choice by the end of Floor 2. There are very, very few runs you'll know if your run is good enough to beat Mother by Floor 2. And if for some reason later on in the run you want to go to Mother, well, good luck. You still either need Sharp Key or Broken Padlock to open up the Flesh Door. Not even Dad's key works. So I have a couple solutions. One being that after you completed Mother with a given character, that character now has access to the completed knife piece in the special room on Mausoleum from there on forth allowing you to go to Mother if you feel like it on a powerful run, allowing you to again have more player agency in your choices. The other option is to allow any knife or piercing item to open the flesh door after about maybe 10 or so Mother kills to allow more experienced players to branch out into the new paths more. These are just my thoughts. I just think that after a while, collecting both knife pieces becomes a bit tedious, that's all. Anyways, onto the mausoleum and Johanna.